Good morning Year 10, it's Mrs Reed here and welcome to the first of your lessons exploring the topic of relationships. Over the next four PSHE lessons we're going to be covering a number of issues surrounding relationships. We'll be talking about what healthy versus unhealthy relationships look like. We'll be talking about consent and the law. We'll be exploring what happens when things go wrong in a relationship. What are the unhealthy behaviours and perhaps even warning signs that we need to be aware of? We'll be talking about what happens in long-term relationships, choices that we might make in the future, around marriage and parenting. And we'll also be talking about online relationships too, and how we can manage them in positive ways, making sure that we are keeping ourselves safe and managing risk. So as we can see, today's topic focuses on healthy relationships. All of these lessons then are designed to be in line with the topics that we would cover in class. Some of them are particularly tricky and sensitive topics to handle. All of the resources I've put together are in line with trusted and um, charities and organisations for PSHE teaching, including the NSPCC and Childline and the PSHE Association. Because we are not in the classroom and we don't have the opportunity to discuss issues and ask questions in the same way, it's really important that you follow the links that I um, uh, signpost you to on Show My Homework and I'll be talking quite a lot about places that you can go for further support, wider reading, to helplines, and also who you can speak to in the college if you have a concern. It's really important to remember that even though that we aren't in the classroom, we are still here to discuss things with you, to answer questions. And you can contact any member of staff at TCC if you want to ask questions of me as your PSHE teacher after the lesson, you can contact me on my college email address. And alternatively, if you want to speak to somebody in the college confidentially, you can use the worries at tall point email. So as a quick starter activity, I want you just to draw me two faces on your page. One that's looking happy and one that's looking sad. And what we're going to do is just spend two minutes plotting around those faces some key words. So around the happy face, I want you to plot for me what you think are the qualities of a good and healthy, even a happy relationship. See if you can write down four to five key words. And on the other side, with the sad face, I want you to plot around things you would associate with an unhealthy relationship. These might be the opposite ideas and feelings, but again, try to get four to five words. Pause the video and spend no longer than two minutes on the task. Okay. So I think here you might have had things such as good communication and mutual respect, trust, honesty, being equal, so there's no power imbalance, and being able to be yourself. These are all going to be really important factors in a positive and healthy relationship, something that makes us feel good. Um, and this can be in a friendship, this could be in a same sex, or opposite sex relationship. It's really important that these healthy and good qualities are understood and they help us then to be, to be able to identify when things go wrong and aren't so good. If you don't have good communication with somebody, if you can't talk to them and share your ideas and feelings, that's not going to be particularly healthy. If there isn't a mutual respect from both people, or if somebody isn't trustworthy, if they're dishonest and deceitful, that's going to be something particularly unhealthy. 
So I'd like to start our exploration with the issue of friendship and understanding what it means to be a good friend and what bad friendships look like can be a really useful way to starting to explore ideas around relationships. In order to do this, I'm going to signpost you to watch two videos. The first one is Cherry Wallace, who discusses um, friendship. And I would like you to watch her video and then complete the sentence stems at the top of the page. I'd like you to tell me, based on her ideas, what a good friend should be, what this person would do and what this person would not do. Once you've done that, I would like you to watch Suli's video. He also discusses friendship and he goes into a range of positives and negatives. So I want you to watch that video too and then also complete the sentence stems. What does Suli suggest a good friendship includes? And what does Suli suggest a bad friendship includes? Can you pause the video? and complete those ta two tasks now, please. Okay, now you have completed those tasks and engaged in a range of issues around friendship, we can start thinking about other forms of relationship. We've mentioned here already that these six factors are really important to understanding and um, what a good and healthy relationship looks like. So the next factor for us to consider in a healthy relationship is the issue of consent. So throughout the next few lessons, we'll be talking about issues of consent and what it means ethically and legally and what it should look like in practice. So we're learning that everybody has the right to withdraw their consent at any time. It's really important that we have a definition of consent to work with. So I will recommend that you pause the video and write that definition down. Okay, let's read through this. So consent is an agreement which is given willingly and freely without exploitation, threat or fear and by a person who has the capacity to give their consent or give their agreement. It's really important that when we talk about this that consent um, is really part of any healthy relationship. So it's not solely limited to situations of a sexual nature. When we're looking at this definition of consent we can think about those times where we um, cho choose to do something. We're giving our agreement and saying, yes, this is something that I want. Um, and where there might be times in a relationship when people do things that they wouldn't necessarily want to do um, for a partner or for a friend. Consent can refer to any activity. We could give our agreement to meet up with a friend, to watch a film with them, to share our phone number for example, to send them a message. And we must be free to do that, we're making our own choice. But we can also talk about sexual consent and this refers to a positive choice that's taken in, to, sorry, a positive choice to take part in a sexual activity by people who understand the nature and the implication of the activity they're agreeing to. So consent must be free, an active personal choice. It's not something that can be assumed or inferred, can't be encouraged or coerced, gained by exploitation. In addition to this, the person giving consent must have the capacity to do so. So that means that they should be old enough. They should have all the information they need to make this decision and be in a fit state to give consent. So for example, they can't be under the influence or have their judgment impaired by alcohol or drugs. It's the person seeking consent who is legally and ethically responsible for ensuring 
that agreement has been given and meets these criteria. The seeker of consent can't see consent as a one-off, but it must be a continual process and an important part in the communication that we have with one another. It's important to understand this within the law. In England, the legal age of consent to sexual activity is 16 years old. And we know that in law, this is also defined as an agreement by choice made by someone with the freedom and capacity to consent. And as I've just mentioned, under the law, it's the person seeking consent who is responsible for making sure those conditions are met. What we're going to do next is explore a scenario. And I use this video in class and it's a really useful way for thinking about the key signs of consent and also some of the misconceptions um, around this issue. I want you to watch the video and think about it in two ways. I want you to think about the things we've discussed around healthy relationships, but also think about issues of consent. Is everyone in this video giving, being given a choice? Are they choosing to do things willingly and freely? Or are they being pressured and um, coerced, um, sort of even intimidated in some way? So pause the video and watch the clip. And then in a few moments, we're going to be answering some questions around it. Okay, so the big question that comes out of this is, is this a healthy relationship that we're witnessing? And when we say healthy relationship, we could also be thinking about friendship. What happened when Dan and his friends arrived at the house? Was that a part of a healthy relationship? Can you remember what happened in the video with um, different people drinking alcohol or having their possessions taken? Were these part of a healthy relationship? If we were in class now, we'd be able to discuss the scenario and we'd be talking in depth about what happened, why and what could be done differently. As we can't do that today, I think it's really important that you spend some time answering questions independently before I'll talk through each one of them with you. Can you pause the video and write the numbers 1 to 10 in the margin of your page? When you've done that, make a few notes next to each number for the question. You don't need to write in full sentences here. You can make short notes and bullet points, but make sure you've considered questions one to 10 before you carry on. So pause the video and do that now, please. Okay. I'm glad you've got, had a chance to watch the video and go through each question. This video is actually created by Childline and it's called Listen to Your Selfie. It's a really important one for exploring the story of a young woman, Lara, who is being pressured into a more intimate relationship than she is ready for. We're left with a question at the end, wondering how she would respond. So let's unpick some of the ideas presented in that video. Number one, how do you think Lara is feeling when Dan is flirting with her? Okay, so hopefully you noted here some really positive feelings and that's for absolutely fine. It may well be that L Lara is feeling happy, curious and excited. Maybe she's feeling flattered and enjoying the attention she receives. All of these are really valid feelings. And even if Lara starts feeling this way, it's still possible for her or anybody else in that scenario to change their feelings. Two, how do you think Lara is feeling the moment the film ends? Okay, hopefully you noted here much more negative emotions. 
By the end of the video, Lara seems nervous and awkward. We get the impression she is unhappy and scared. Maybe she's feeling slightly intimidated and powerless. Does that fit with any of the things that you've written down? I think there are some clear signs of this in her body language and the way that she behaved and the things that she said. Number three. What concerns does Lara have? Well, there could be a whole number of things here. Maybe Lara's not ready. Maybe she feels drunk. She doesn't know what to do. There might also be some other fears that she's worried Dan would spread rumours about her. Or she feels that she owes Dan in some way. Maybe she doesn't know what she wants and she doesn't really know how to tell Dan this. What techniques does Dan use to persuade Lara? Okay, so there should be some warning signs of an unhealthy relationship here. Note that Dan arrives at the party uninvited. He brings alcohol into her house. He compliments her. He touches her and invades her in personal space. He also shows negative um, qualities of trying to manipulate her by making her feel guilty, saying he will get someone else, pushes her against the sink and doesn't seem to really be paying any attention to what it is that Lara wants. Why might Lara... Sorry, number five. What signs are there that Lara wants Dan to stop? Okay, you may have noted here that there were an, um, lots of indications. We could see from her facial expression, the way she tries to push him away, the fact that she moves his hand off of her body, but she looks nervous. She seems to be sweating. She says things like, but my friends are here. There are lots of indications that Lara wants Dan to stop. Number six. Why might Lara feel that she has to do what Dan is asking her to do? Well, there are a number of factors here that might make her feel pressured. And they may also be linked to some misconceptions too. Maybe she feels that he won't want to hang out with her if she doesn't do this. Or that she owes him in some way. He's older than her, he's brought round alcohol. Perhaps he will say some terrible things about her. It's really important to remember here that Lara is under no obligation at all to do what Dan wants. In fact, the responsibility is on Dan to check and um, communicate that she is consenting before they go any further. Number seven. Thinking back to our definition of consent, if Lara goes, decides to go upstairs with Dan, is she giving her consent to anything? Okay, I hope you noted here that it's really important to know that if someone is being pressured, pressurised, coerced, that even if they say yes or do what the person asks, this does not constitute consent. It's really important that we explore the idea that it is the seeker of consent in this scenario, Dan, to uh, ensure that this is something that Lara really wants to go ahead with. If Dan continues to have sex with her without ensuring Lara really wants to do this, he is guilty of rape. So that the absence of no does not mean yes. Number eight, how would Dan act differently if he really cared about Lara? Okay. Well, there are a number of things here. We said a healthy relationship means good communication. So he should really be watching her facial expressions, her body language and listening to the words that she says. If he acted, if he really cared about her, 
he would not only listen to what she wants to do, but would wait until she was ready, and had given her consent willingly and freely. If Dan behaved in this way, would Lara feel differently? And would this produce a better outcome? Well, Lara might move their relationship further, might have a physical, intimate relationship with him, although she also may not. If she didn't want to, she would still feel respected by Dan and trust would develop between them. There could be severe consequences for Dan, as the legal and the moral responsibility in this scenario lies with him. As we've mentioned before, if he continues to do this without ensuring her consent, he is guilty of rape. So the behaviour here does really need to change and it definitely would shift how Lara is feeling and would make their relationship a healthier one. Okay, final question. What could Lara's friends do next if they were concerned? Well, Lara's friends could go and look for her if they realised she was missing. They could interrupt the conversation in the kitchen or on the stairs. Her friends could play an important part in um, asking Dan to leave or asking Laura to come back down to the lounge and stay with them. Her friends might choose to call her parents for advice and support. And if they really felt that Lara or they were in any immediate danger, they might call the police. Okay, as I said, this is a really difficult topic to deal with remotely, and it's important that we do ask questions. So there are a number of uh, uh, helplines and websites linked here. We you can go for further advice and I will add them on to show my homework. It's also important that you um, ask questions. So if following this lesson, there's anything else that you would like to know, please get in contact with a member of staff at TCC. So we've been talking about this idea that good communication between both partners is really important. That we check with the, that we're happy with what the other person is doing if they're enjoying it, if this is something that they want to do and continue with. We've noted that it's important to read body language. So if a person is relaxed, it's likely they feel comfortable. If they are tense, they're more likely to be nervous, frightened, or perhaps hiding how they feel. It's important we look out for signs that somebody is not consenting to sex. Sometimes it can be really hard for people to say anything at all if they don't want to have sex. So if someone stops kissing you, doesn't want to be hugged or held, this could be a really important sign of non-consent. Don't ignore it. And the final hard-hitting point that we've made here, and it is an important one, is that if one person doesn't want to have sex, the other person needs to accept that. It's not okay to try and change their mind. Pressuring someone into sex is rape. This also applies to pressuring someone to having sex without contraception. Okay, that brings us to the end of the lesson. We have discussed a range of topics here around friendship, healthy and relationships, and also issues of consent. What I would like you to um, do next then is just reflect on our learning. And I have several questions I would like you to answer as your exit ticket. Thank you for listening and please do follow up by clicking on some of the links that I've shared with you on Show My Homework. So you might wish to choose two of these sentence stems and just write down something that you didn't know that you now know or something perhaps that you can see how it might connect to your life choose a sentence, write it out, and then you have finished the lesson. Thanks for listening, guys, and please keep in touch.